Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm Tan Sui Che, the immediate past president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. Welcome to Anthony Hodgson's lecture on systems thinking and the tragedy of consciousness, part of the behavioral science series of the IFOA's 2021 Thought Leadership Program. This program has been generously sponsored by Hong Kong based IFOA fellow, Dr. Patrick Poon. Thanks to his kind support, we are able to host the events in the entire series free of charge to members and non members. At the last count, there were over 240 people tuning into today's webinar. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all. By now, you are all appraised of our desire to bring thought leadership to the foreground of the IFOA once more. This is very much in line with our strategy as we seek to reposition the IFOA as a center of key societal debates, add to the debate and move the conversation forward and aim to build the IFOA reputation as an authority to execute our public interest duties. Today's event aims to shift the profession's attention away from our traditional domains and core skill sets. It seeks to engage and encourage the members of the IFOA in a widening of our skill sets and the diversifying of our mindsets to address two critical factors to help bring our vision of a transformed IFOA and the profession to life. And secondly, to recognize many of the radical uncertainty and sustainability challenges just we deal with require a new approach, a systemic and multidisciplinary approach if we are going to help change the conversation. As a profession, we recognize we need to be more forward-looking, more outward-looking, to move beyond technical debates and to be bolder in navigating external paradigms and to take our conversations to a higher level if we are to remain relevant and consequential. Over the course of the next six weeks, we, will, we still have three sessions left. On 9th of July, Professor Hermenia Ibarra will talk about reinventing your career. What got you here will not get you there. She will share her unconventional methods on how actuaries can step up for better impact by acting first and then thinking later. She will upend traditional introspective advice and proposals that we do not rely on insight, which is based on internal knowledge, past experience and thinking but instead rely on outside, which is based on external knowledge, new experience and acting. On 14th of July, David Rook will speak on the actuary who is only an actuary is not an actuary. He will talk about the internal logics each of us adopt and how actuaries can adopt different mindsets, techniques and capabilities and use language, power and experimentation differently to be more effective in today's complex world. Finally, but not least, past presidents, Ronnie Bowie, Paul Thornton, myself, Jane Curtis, and a past chair of the management board, Sally Bridgeland, will speak on how we are doing in repositioning the profession for the wider fields and how consequential we are in addressing the societal challenges of our time. You can see on this slide, the speakers we have lined up for the remainder of this series. I do hope you are able to join us for each of these sessions. Session. Today, systems thinking expert Anthony Hodgson will speak on think systems thinking and the tragedy of consciousness. Before his presentation, Dr. Erica Thompson, Senior Policy Fellow at the LSE Data Science Institute, and Nico Espinon, Chief Investment Officer at BSCE, will set the scene and provide a context for Anthony's talk. They will explore the limits of mathematics, modeling, and actual science in responding to today's challenges and the need to transcend our traditional toolkit and methods in search for answers in today's complex and uncertain world. They will then join Anthony for a panel discussion around the themes of the session. Now that I've given you the context, I'm delighted to say a few words about today's speakers. Anthony Hodgson's is a founding trustee of H3Uni, a university of the third horizon. 
This is an initiative born out of recognition by a small group of foresight and strategy practitioners that today's professions, higher education and business schools do not address the huge shift in the skills of collaboration and resilient thinking that are needed to successfully navigate a turbulent world challenged by major issues not previously experienced on a global scale. Anthony has over 40 years of experience of providing consulting and facilitation services in foresight and strategy to international corporations and in the public sector in the UK. He is an expert in transformative innovation and new methods of cooperation. He has a doctorate in system science from Howe University and is, is a research fellow with the University of Dundee, where he is currently doing original work on integrating foresight methods with systems thinking and modeling through second order cybernetics, phenomenology of time perception and futures method. Anthony will combine three areas of his expertise in an unorthodox way in today's session. Systems thinking, scenarios, futures method, and conscious participation in the present moment in the context of the phenomenology of time perception. In my own words, this will, not, this will mean not just reliance on facts and evidence, but also on foresight and imagination and the mindfulness and engagement of groups in the expanded present moment. Dr. Erica Thompson is a senior fellow in ethics of modeling and simulation at the LSE Data Science Institute. Erica's research is centered around the use of mathematical and computational models to inform real-world decision-making. She has a deep interest on fundamental philosophical questions about what model outputs really mean and how we use models, models in tandem with expert judgment. Erica gained a PhD in physics from Imperial College on statistical and dynamical modeling of North Atlantic storms under climate change. Nico Espino is the Chief Investment Officer for BNCE, which includes the People's Pension, the largest DC Master Trust in the UK. He is the chair, he is the former chair of the Resource and Environmental Board, now known as the Sustainability Board of the IOA, and a former member of the council. Nico received a master's in theoretical physics from Cambridge University in 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, you can submit a question at any time via the online Q&A on Zoom, and I would like to encourage you to do so. So with this, I pass the floor to Erica, and then Nico, and then Anthony. Erica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Suiche, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really delighted to be asked to set the scene ahead of such a distinguished speaker in Anthony Hodgson. Um, so I thought since we have quite a mathematical audience, and there are many, many ways of approaching Anthony's multifaceted work. Um, I thought I'd start with the mathematics and, and sort of strike one note that maybe Anthony can reflect on. So something that I suppose we've all seen as a challenge over the last decades is that models and mathematics cannot accurately predict the future or not all of it in any case. So uh, we're all familiar with weather modeling where perhaps tomorrow's weather forecast is very good, but the weather forecast for next week, not so good. And for two or three weeks time, you don't even look at it. Um, and all models have their limits. All models have limits to how far you can push them before they simply become inapplicable because the assumptions that underlie them don't hold anymore or because there's some fundamental uncertainty. So I think over the last few decades, we've been moving perhaps from a paradigm of quantifiable risk and you know, sensitivity analysis towards a paradigm more of unquantifiable uncertainty and thinking about what that means and how it influences the way that we do science, the way that we do modeling, the way that we do economic and financial modeling as well. So compl complexity obviously is a big theme of Anthony's work and I work on models as Suiche has said. So perhaps if I say a couple of examples here, that if we take the economy or the earth's climate system or even the current pandemic, we can represent these complex systems in models only by making specific and very general uh, simplifying assumptions about how to do that. And the choice of which dimensions we simplify and which we represent in detail 
is in itself a value judgment. It's a moral and ethical choice. And it's motivated by lots of factors, some of which are sort of obvious to us and some of which are hidden because they are just the way that we've always done things. So for example, why is it that we might start to make a climate model based on the fluid dynamics of the atmosphere rather than one that you could imagine to be sort of equally plausible based on the biosphere, you know, the living networked elements of the biosphere and just have the atmosphere as some sort of sub-module that's parameterized separately. Why do we start with a pandemic model that's based on the infection and mortality of identical single individual agents rather than one based on connected and heterogeneous communities? Again, you could imagine that that would make quite a big difference to the way that it's modeled, the way that we think about the pandemic and the way that we think about the kinds of interventions we might make to tackle the pandemic. Thinking about business forecasting, things like choices of discount rate, um, thinking about maybe pension modeling, something that might be familiar to the audience. The, the assumptions that we make about investment returns over the next decades are going to be first order in terms of how you make decisions there and what kinds of outputs you get from your models. So the point is that these, you know, these alternative, fairly abstract choices in model land, if you like, have real consequences in the real world. And they are they are motivated by moral and ethical judgments and they have moral and ethical consequences. It's not just a different way of doing a sensitivity analysis. It's actually a completely different way of framing the question and a different way of thinking about it. So my, uh, you know, my contention here that I think Anthony might riff off is that the representations we make are not objective predictors of the future and instead that they are sort of boundary objects which facilitate and direct group discussions about the future and determine the way that we, as individuals and as a group, think about and interact with a system. So as such, our models are actually active participants in, the, in, in a subjective creation of the future, not just predictive engines. So if computers can help us to calculate, but they can't help us to think, we need people who will help us to think. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's what Anthony Hodgson is able to help us with and to give us some insights here. So these, these kind of multidisciplinary insights from wide ranging systems thinkers who are taking a multiplicity of perspectives like Anthony Hodgson, I think they'll be critical to effective risk management on all scales over the next hundred years. So I look forward to seeing what you have to say. No pressure. <laughs> uh, Nico? Thank you and uh, good morning everybody. I'm delighted to be here to, to uh, help introduce Anthony um, and I think for my uh, uh, kind of bridge, my, my introduction, I'd, I'd ask you to think about professionalism and your role as an actuary. So um, I, I've kind of framed a question which is uh, are we deluding ourselves when we talk about actuarial science when in fact being a professional practicing judgment uh, is an art and it's an art backed with science but we need to recapture that sense uh, of, of being uh, plural in the way we address our, our, our careers. So yes actuaries use models um, but is it really realistic for a professional just to be the communicator of an output from a model and to suggest, to pretend that that is the only answer uh, that could satisfy. To me, it, it feels like we can reduce just this very broad skill set of being an actuary to uh, a, an algorithmic process, essentially, where the actuary forgets that they are actually responsible in gaining consensus from the stakeholders to, to decide whether that is the right process and indeed to discuss alternative approaches, alternative algorithms, alternative ways of getting to that solution. So there's a risk that actuaries have backed themselves into corners where we're less able or less willing uh, to challenge the existing models rather than uh, the, the, the forming a process to bring together the stakeholders into deciding how to uh, approach a problem. So we're acting as if we're a player on a football pitch who has forgotten that actually we're, we're also the referee in our roles. We also helped to design the game and we will also help to change those rules uh, as we go forward into the future. So how do we reimagine that role of an actuary moving away from just being a model communicator um, and into the realm of being the referee and designer of the game? 
as we go into the 21st century, we know that climate change and sustainability are going to be profound challenges. And they'll be more profound if we don't have a cohort of actuaries who are willing to discuss with their clients and their wider stakeholder groups exactly what we think the real problem is uh, and how we intend to go about addressing them. Uh, we do not have data on the future. So the calibration of our models into the future must be much more art than science. And for me, that's what makes Anthony such a fascinating speaker. He, he talks to a number of different ways that we can think about actuarial work, uh, not on the basis of the models, but on the ways we think about the future and the ways we engage our clients with the problems they face and how we support the management of change in a world which is inherently unpredictable. So, yes, looking forward very much to, to hearing what, what Anthony has to say. Thanks, thanks, Nico. Uh... And then the floor is yours. <clears throat> well, thank you for um, inviting me to take part in this uh, event and contribute. Um, it was something of a surprise to me when I was approached because, uh, as I said to Tan Tzu Chi, um, I would not have put in my plan, uh, approach the Institute of Actuaries to give a talk on my work, um, but it's fascinating now to uh, encounter the um, the kind of challenges that I believe you face, which are endemic and popping up in all kinds of ways. So I, I ask your forgiveness if I have already, if I've misunderstood certain aspects of your profession, but what I hope to do is to share with you some perspectives that um, will stimulate you to pick up on the themes that um, Erica and Nico have, um, have, have put in front of you. So I'm not going to respond um, immediately to those challenges because we're going to have a little forum after I've introduced uh, some thoughts and we can, um, we can debate those uh, more fully perhaps for a few minutes um, at, the, at the end. So let me just um, make sure that um, I'm uh, sharing the right material with you. Um, so I, I thought about um, the wider implications of what Erica is working on. And uh, one of my favorite um, sources is a French systems philosopher called uh, Edgar Moran. And um, I thought this sort of um, was an interesting thought starter. Along with civilization, technology brings a new barbarism that is both anonymous and manipulative. The word of reason signifies not only critical rationality, but also the logical delirium of rationalization with its blindness to concrete beings and the complexity of reality. What we take to be advances in civilization are at the same time advances in barbarism. So that's a very strong statement of, of what are the hidden assumptions behind the highly technical, mathematical, scientific uh, world that we've been creating over the last uh, particularly hundred years. And from the point of view of the professional angle, um, here's a thought from um, Professor Roberto Poli of the University of Trento who happened to be an examiner for my PhD, um, uh, an organization unable to grasp new circumstances is an organism that behaves on the basis of stimuli that belong to a previous era. Well, I think you'll recognize there are implications from uh, both of those perspectives, but it boils down to something like this. Um, the way uh, I've summarized it, that um, in the field of particularly of sustainability and the environment and 
things like the upcoming um, COP26 conference on climate change. Uh, the, the, the term the Anthropocene uh, is becoming current, uh, invented really as a term to say that we've reached an era which has geological scale in terms of humanity's impact on, on the planet and the biosphere. And the two opening points about um, blindness and about um, uh, um, living on the stimuli from the past and not the current situation lead to three tragedies uh, a tragedy of the commons which is well known in systems science uh, in terms of the um, uh, uh, destruction of the environment the tragedy of the horizons which mark carney used that term in his wreath lectures in terms of seeing into the future and I've added the tragedy of consciousness, by which I mean, how are we as aware human beings actually sufficiently aware? So let's let's put ourselves in the middle of this um, triangle. Um, and recognize that we have an actuarial professional sphere, which Nico pointed out, and within that, we have all kinds of tools and methods and procedures and assumptions and computations and so on. And it's fine. It, it obviously works very well. Otherwise, we wouldn't have got to where we are now. But this is taking place now in a vastly expanded complications of the environment, which we simply call the Anthropocene realities. And th those include, just to give a, a quick headlines, um, a lot of geopolitical and economic aggravations. Um, there's the pandemics and, and the well-being crises that that presents in society. And there's the climate and environmental emergencies. Now these can be, we can be well insulated from for a while, but eventually we find that we're in a, an intermediate zone, which you might call the contextual relevance sphere, what is actually relevant to what we're doing in the clients that we work with. And uh, from that sphere, we find ourselves getting shocked that the risk profile is changing. Things perhaps don't fit as well as they used to. Um, as Erica was saying, the we, 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 we could forecast um, uh, 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 a year ahead. Now we can only forecast a month ahead and it's getting down to a week and so on, those kinds of changes. So we can break that into uh, three um, areas which correspond to the three tragedies. Um, and the tragedy of consciousness I put at the uh, geopolitical economic because this is very much where the power in society tends to lie in terms of, of um, governance and economics and um, who's in charge of what. So we've got three questions. How do we deal with escalating complexity? something that um, Erica pointed to. We've got um, how to deal with confusing futures, which um, is also part of the professional thinking ahead. And how to deal with perhaps that we have missing mind capacities, uh, mental skills, attitudinal skills, and so on. So I'm going to go through those three questions. Um, and uh, um, we'll see um, what can uh, uh, I can contribute in terms of just a few sample thoughts from you know quite a large stock of things which are now in in the field I'm talking about. So how to deal with escalating complexity? Well, one of the people I worked with um, uh, a year or two back was. Uh, Finn, Timo Hamalainen, who's a senior uh, policy strategist 
for uh, Citra, the uh, Finnish parliament think tank. And he um, summarized the challenge that we're facing is the complexity gap. There are serious governance problems at all levels of our societies. Individuals suffer from growing life management problems. Corporations struggle to adapt to their rigid hierarchies. Governments run from one crisis to another and multinational institutions make very little progress in solving global problems. A transition to the next phase of societal development requires closing the complexity gap with new governance innovations or else societies may face disintegration and chaos. So this is what we call the complexity gap. So a quick diagram. You can think of it as the vertical dimension is more and more stimuli because the environment is churning and turbulent. We can increase the variety of our responses and we can even increase them prodigiously. We can have huge tower blocks of complexity uh, or huge now computer networks of um, complexity. But the question is, do they, do they balance? Or we can take the simple uh, um, populist approach of let's find a hero leader and dump it all on, on uh, the person who's going to save us. Whereas actually um, what we face is, is a, a new way of learning how to navigate in turbulence. And that's the gap that we're facing. If we can't begin to close that gap, we're, um, we're vulnerable. Um, it's useful to think of Dave Snowden's way of looking at this, the, the Sinophon framework, where these are perhaps four situations in the world. And we've got quite good at the complicated area. Um, uh, uh, um, but if we take those sophisticated supercomputer mathematical models and so on, and we use them solely to try and solve problems in the complex area, we're creating a confusion and there will be consequences. Now, from a systems perspective, um, this is a, a, a summary of, um, of uh, systems thinking on one slide. It's quite con concentrated. One of the pioneers of the field um, was Gregory Bateson, who talked about the pattern that connects, particularly in terms of biology and ecology. But also he was a, um, a researcher in, in family therapy and alcoholism and addiction and so on. And very much looking at the interconnecting patterns, not just putting it all on the, uh, the, the, the prime sufferer, as it were. And down here, the um, uh, Heinz von Forster, the matrix that connect, embeds, the, 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 the patterns are, are caught up in whatever the substance of, of um, life uh, we're, we're looking at. So what you get here is a pattern dynamic you get a pattern which configures the activity within it. Um, society in, or, or groups of people participate in that pattern and that reinforces and produces a strength in the patterning. And this loop begins to uh, achieve a life of its own, so to speak. And Buckminster Fuller, the uh, innovator that you obviously know about from geodesic domes, but he was quite a deep thinker. And he talked about a pattern integrity that um, that when one of these patterns is, is strengthened, you know, like, like professional habits that um, Nico was talking about, then it doesn't matter who's in the profession, the pattern continues. Um, the pattern is in a way uh, stronger than its components. Um, so complexity really requires a shift from uh, linear thinking into looking at pattern thinking of which the different schools of systems thinking are, are um, examples. So let's move on to the future. Um, how to deal with confusing futures. So I think a very important question, particularly in a, in a world that easily from science gets dominated by uh, 
deterministic assumptions is is the future fixed or open to agency or to put it um bluntly is there anything we can do about it or is it just happening um the problem with the forecasting approach is it puts it all out there as happening um the entrepreneurs uh, take the different agency line and say well, we're going to make the future but it's neither of those in its uh, uh, completeness um so the way of looking at that is say okay i've just described the, uh, the 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 situation of a fixed patterning configures a constrained participating you know who is allowed to be a member of the club where the boundaries are drawn and that reproduces the fixed patterning and this creates a rigid world or lock-in it can it, it's often called and um that dynamic it's rather like a gyroscope if it's spinning very quickly it's for hard to interfere with its trajectory because it will simply spin back into its uh, fixed um, central position and those of you who have tried to change systems and organizations um, uh, or even um, uh, recklessly tried to change people will have uh, recognized that but somehow we have to find a way to break out of that and move to um, uh, a different dynamic where repatterning that, that we're open to reframing repatterning reconfiguring um, the way that we go about things so that would imply for example um, Nico's switch from reproducing the content of actuarial work to looking at the processes whereby we develop that and which so we can constantly repattern the profession and that 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 requires a, a change in who's who's involved in in um, bringing that about perhaps the membership the boundary condition is important and so um uh what what where are the what scope is there for the creative and innovative people who can uh, again, feed the repatterning, and that begins to offer the prospect of a, 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 of a transformative world. And we call that participative repatterning. It's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, there's a huge amount of practice and research in those two words. So here's a way of looking into the future for that transformation, because you can't do a transformation unless you've got some idea of where you're trying to get to. We call that future consciousness. So just imagine we're looking ahead into the future. But of course, we can't actually look into time. Uh, so we tend to use space as a metaphor. So talking horizons is a, is a way of kind of um, uh, get, having our minds be able to get a bit of a grip on this. So you can picture that we're we're living in a, a in a, in a world of um, the vertical dimension is it's reasonably effective, um, and then um, there's the threat of difficulties, and the 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 fitness for purpose of that system that we're in declines and can start declining very rapidly. So that's horizon one, the red line. So we need some kind of um, vision of the future um, that may be in the distance, so to speak, but we can make some sort of sh shape out of it. Um, but we're going to have to go through difficult transformational times. So it's helpful if we've got some kind of North Star or beacon <coughs> on the mountain. And so we can begin to set off on that transformation journey, but we'll have to go through the thicket, the forest, the jungle, and it's easy to get lost there, which is why we need that beacon on the mountain to help guide us to the, the next stage, uh, which we can then see more clearly. So that's what we, in a nutshell, call the <coughs> Three Horizons Future Method. And you can see that it has um, forecasting in the sense that the red line 
is very much about what's almost inevitable um, uh, that we can pick up by analysis, but it has agency as well, which is the, the um, in two ways, the green line is the agency of visioning a different or better future. And it's got the horizon two agency, if we can do something about it, we can actually navigate that uh, gap. So here's just a quick summary of that in a different way. The um, vertical line here, <clears throat> you could picture as the strategic fit with a changing environment. You know, how fit for purpose is the actuarial profession? The wavy line here at the top represents the continuous and accelerating change in the Anthropocene. Um, we have a particular pattern we've got wedded to in the way that we do things and there are good reasons for that because for a while it works very well but it's a limited worldview and increasingly its policies and procedures and decisions are, are uh, incongruent with what's actually going on up there in the environment so we then um, begin to vision well what what would a pattern be that would be appropriate for this kind of new environment and um that's where we need creative thinking because usually that pattern is um significantly different from where we are now so for example if the first pattern is a pile of bricks and the second pattern is a, a, a say a living plant you can't turn a pile of bricks into a plant by just adding more bricks, which is what we normally try and do. So this is a different worldview, which I, I favour, obviously, the systemic worldview promises more congruent policies and decisions. And we can't grow this green line usually at a speed that matches the decline of the red line because Growing the green line needs resources, but the red line is defensive and won't release them. Uh, try and get new money for new things. But we can create an entrepreneurial kind of zone, um, which is a turbulent transition. And we've got a paradigm clash, a pattern clash between the horizon one and the horizon three. But that's the transition we need to um, navigate but if we can begin to get um, our heads around that and our feelings as well that the, the, it needs the whole person then we can see that um, if we're going to bring about a significant change it'll go through phases with different risks at each of these phases so the the the, the difficulty in the shorter term is believability perhaps in in the middle of the um, process uh, is probably conflicting priorities of, of trying to keep the lights on and make the change and uh, the the um, uh, risk at the final stage is um, are we are we actually understanding sufficiently the the, the new situation now, how, how long is that transition uh, depends very much on what the system we're talking about is. Um, so if we're looking at a, um, a professional change, we're probably looking at um, close on a generation. But on the other hand, things are moving so quickly in this new environment that maybe we, we have to really also focus on um, accelerated learning. And uh, if we have good ideas for that, we have to be careful because um, these H2 ideas can get captured by Horizon 1 to prop it up. Uh, we, can, we can see that with the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, quite a lot of good ideas floating around, but mainly used to prop up the same, same old system. Or we can have um, uh, innovative ideas that really move us forward towards the third horizon. So finally, let's have a look at mind. Um, 
missing mind capacity. So the first step I believe is <clears throat> to recognize that we're, 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 we're not external to the global system, that there, there, there are, we, in economics, for example, we've used the concept of externalities very conveniently, but actually there is no away, there is no externality. Um, so on the left, you've got the deterministic view that here I am, uh, a dispassionate observer looking at a system of interest and analyzing it, deciding what to do about it, and um, and generally, you know, uh, not not part of the system. Whereas in the emergent paradigm, what is called the second order paradigm, um, the you, the observer, are part of the pattern, and you not only observe, you participate. Um, as as uh, Erica was saying, you 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 choose a mathematical model and um, compute with it, and think that's outside of you in the left, but in the right, you realise that you have ethical responsibilities as to what sort of choices you're making and for what reason. So um, the old paradigm. We tend to put, you know, big data first, uh, supercomputers and the whole uh, apparatus of um, modern technology without considering the human factor that our, our knowledge of what to do with the data, our judgment, our wisdom is internalized in the experience of the user or the applier and we're participating in, in 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 this whether we recognize it or not so i've summed this up in my research as something i call the anticipatory present moment the apm and um it would probably take um at least a half day uh, seminar to begin to explain that except that I, I thought I could pick one aspect of it that would um, give you a chance to get a hold of it. So let's try this out. Okay, here, the circle represents now. And it implies a question. Um, how big is your now? Is it a little now what um, Professor Poli called the thin present moment? Or is it embracing a bigger range, um, uh, the thick present moment? But yet the present moment doesn't exist without you. So you are a, 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 a patterning system. And the key thing for the transformation of that patterning is your own self-insight. You are the starting point of transforming um the the uh, situation um there are different influences that come to bear on that um the traditional ones of course what happened in the past um where we get the data from uh, empirical knowledge uh, we like to call it and also we've got um inherited forms you know our, our, our profession is structured in a in a certain way and we we juggle with that in the first paradigm but in the second paradigm we're open to um uh disruptive ideas like there are other ways of knowing the future than through data um there are other ways that um creative insight can emerge so for example we can be more aware of um what my futures um colleagues often call the sort of looming future the kind of things maybe 10 to 15 years ahead that we we know are there but we can't put our finger on directly um, we become more conscious of those um, we can be much more aware of potentials um, if we only stay inside that first bubble that I call the um, actuarial professional sphere we'll only see things which relate to that sphere, whereas perhaps what we need is to import much wider potentials, which uh, hopefully is why uh, one of the reasons I'm uh, speaking to you right now. Um, how, do we, how do we improve our search for potentials? Um, living commitments. Um, 
uh, just because, say, the profession needs to transform, transforming is not the same as throwing away. So there are certain historical, uh, really important values and um, aims and traditions in the profession that are that, that are not to be jettisoned, but perhaps repolished and re refined and repositioned. And then perhaps the most important one is what have we not thought about yet? I know that that Rumsfeld, who is, uh, as you know, just passed away, was uh, often uh, ridiculed for his statements about the future. But I think there is a, a key point that there are unknown unknowns. And do we actually send out exploratory expeditions? Uh, like we used to when we were trying to find out what the planet Earth was. You know, what are the what are the mental expeditions that we need to make, which are more more creative and more bold often than than uh, conventional research. Um, I, I I belong to a network of researchers who have all been thrown out of academia because we 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 challenge the paradigms, uh, which is why we've got our um, little. Uh, fledgling university that does it differently. So um, here's our actual span of consciousness. Um, and um, uh, perhaps in this new Anthropocene challenge, we need to stretch that. And we need to recognize that although that's a personal individual thing at the start, it's also a collaborative thing. And one of the things that second order cybernetics points out is that you, you've got to have conscious participants, you've got to also have a community coherence, and you've got to have a new resonant language for that to take off. Uh, now that's a bit complex, but Heinz von Forster put it rather neatly like this, like chicken, egg, rooster, to have any one, it is necessary to have all three. So I've taken you on a quick tour around the possibility of uh, ideas, tools, approaches, and I've given you just an opening gambit on, on, on these um, in, in all three areas. And um, uh, there's, there's more that could follow, uh, which um, that's why I, I just slip a little commercial in at the end. So thank you. I've, I've um, now... Um, uh, Anthony, uh, thanks for such a clear exposition uh, on some very profound and different concepts uh, in dealing with complexity, in dealing with the future. Uh, and in dealing with uh, to, to be present uh, and to engage one another. Uh, I, I, I thought that one way to start uh, is to ask uh, Nico and Erica whether they do have any questions or to ask uh, what resonated with them. Uh, and, and in particular, I, I was curious uh, for Erica when she talks about the limits of modeling and the limits of mathematics. Uh, how does this walk around the bigger issues help? And Nico, uh, for our profession, I was piqued by the way you described that we are not players in a football field. We are seen as referees and designer of the rules. And this can be very pertinent, given some of the debates taking place in the UK today, like say the pension debate, right? So how do we lift uh, our sights higher? Uh, and get a more security in terms of looking at all these issues beyond our traditional strengths. Uh, so maybe, uh, Erica, that's how I frame it. Uh, I have questions of my own, uh, but and there's, a, an, an, there's an excellent question in, uh, from the audience as well. But let's just talk amongst ourselves for 10, 15 minutes. Erica, and then Nico, and then Anthony can respond. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you both. And thank you, Anthony. Um, 
Yeah, maybe just to pick up on one of your later points then, um, you mentioned Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns and the sort of the concept, what have we not thought about yet? Um, maybe the pandemic is an interesting example of that because the, you know, obviously to some it seemed like it came completely out of nowhere, but actually pandemic has been at the top of the cabinet office risk register, for instance, for, you know, several years now. It was clearly expected and yet there's, you know, so I suppose there's a question of what is it that we we know, they're the kind of known unknowns, but we're not incorporating them, you know, we are actually actively denying the possibility of something happening or ignoring it or neglecting it or, and perhaps there's something to say there about the role of sort of probabilistic descriptions, which, which might say, well, this is possible, but it has an incredibly low probability and therefore I'm just going to ignore it, versus mm -hmm. a kind of forecast you know foresight or impact space thing of saying well this is possible and perhaps you know maybe it doesn't make sense to actively put it into any of my models for the next 10 years but i need to be thinking about it kind of in the second order as a as a sort of question of robustness to these possible but low probability but high impact events um, so I wonder maybe if you had any reflections on that. I think we've seen, for instance, in in climate as well, you know, things happen like the Canadian heat wave just, just this week. Um, things happening that are dramatically beyond what's been predicted in models. Now, of course, what will happen is we'll go back and we'll rewrite the model and, and find the mechanism that contributed to this happening and therefore it will be predicted in the next generation of models. But that doesn't help you in terms of predicting it in the future or the next thing that's going to be the unknown unknown the thing that comes up on you that you didn't expect okay before we open too many doors i, I think uh, uh, maybe let anthony deal with it uh, anthony maybe you want to link uh, her question to another questions we have which is uh, are we not conscious of the risks we live in uh, or are we just being mechanical and your implication of the assertion of tragedy is that human beings are not conscious. So maybe you could take us to that space, linking uh, what Erica asked about why certain risks are not on our register. In fact, they are on other people's mind, uh, but somehow it's not real. Yeah, uh, Anthony? Well, one way of looking at this, I think, is through values um, and valuing that um, a friend of mine, when we were doing some work on um, resilience, you know, as part of the sustainability agenda. Um, summed it up saying, in our culture, we take the resilience premium as profit. In other words, our values are that the, the short term accumulation is uh, far more important than, um, you know, spending our resources on things that have a low probability of actually being um, used or, 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 or effective. Um, and that's part of the, the mechanism of the tragedy, I think, is that we, we, one of the reasons on that little three horizon diagram, there's this gap in the middle between the crossover between the red and the green, is because the values and motivations and ethics in horizon one are stuck in a pattern which even if you've got the data as you were saying erica um uh, i mean i was doing um uh, modeling exercises with the um here with the scottish health system where where pandemics was very high up um back in um, 20 years ago at least um and it was clear from from climate change that um, that there'd be more and more biological hazards getting released from uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and the the the, the 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 exercise I was doing is to help a director of public health shift the conversation to this wider field rather than its microbes. Because if you just look at it as a microbiologist or a virologist conventionally, you 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 you're not changing the the valuation of 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 all these other surrounding factors. Um, 
and the other thing is if you block the created bit uh you're stuck in in in, in we're stuck in the mindsets where it's either this or it's that and you can't have both now uh, there's something we use in our work called dilemma method where it's it, the the metaphor is riding the bull you have to take both horns of the bull and it's very difficult to stay on it and ride it but if you can you can you can have both that there's no reason to say that if you do the prudent things for low probability severe occurrences you can't still have a have a reasonable you know standard of living or something um um so it's it's um uh i don't think uh, statistics might tell us what the problem is but it won't solve it because there's something about human nature that we haven't and i think that's what makes it a tragedy is is that we just um we could have fixed it but we didn't bother uh, uh nico you want to um engage uh, anthony on your and what you said and what what you find most resonant uh, uh, in the framing you, you you did earlier on yeah absolutely thank you um so for me i think that pattern dynamic piece really speaks to very important uh important thought around how we get locked into a kind of feedback loop um i was Going to propose i'm not sure that metaphor is the right word but like uh, an isomorphism so a mapping from one kind of context into another of models so that, that a pattern is a model that we get locked into and also a language so we use words with a specific meaning set to represent numbers and formulae and that that is all contextually patterned in different dimensions so I think Switch, the, the, the question you very deliberately asked me was how do we kind of set our sights higher? So I think the ability to kind of step out of that pattern in some way and get onto the uh, uh, the repatterning and the open participation, I think that's that's the critical piece. And there's almost a memory, isn't there, of a, you know, there was a time when there was, you know, just a field and I'm pretty sure it was we as actuaries who wrote out the lines on the sides of the pitch and wrote down the rules of the game and then decided to call together um, some people who were probably already doing things and call that the pension system or call that the insurance system. Mm. And, and we have to go back to actually there is another field that we need to go and write. And I, and I think that's two things. So one is enabling people to go off and do that and welcoming that challenge, and that's probably a responsibility of the IF way, and we call that thought leadership, and, and you know, we're making great strides. I guess the other side is the not holding us back to some extent, or not being too embedded in that pattern. I think, you know, what proportion of people are going to be designing a new game or a new field is going to be a small proportion compared to the number of people who are playing the existing game. So there's some sort of interesting balance there, and that's where that's where the the three horizons really resonate with me. Um, and I think there's a question back to you, Anthony, which is, you know, what, what's your experience of leadership over those three horizons? How can an executive team or the leadership of an entity kind of hold those two models or you know three models in mind and be effective? Is that that's presumably a lot of your 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 work, or they're kind of shorthand. Stuff. Certainly, it's it's a, it's a component, a strong component. Um, the way my colleague Bill Sharp puts it is, how do we help people shift from mindsets to perspectives? So, if you're dealing with um, uh, an institution or organisational group, generally there's a strong weighting to horizon one um, and the the um, horizon three thinkers are the mavericks or the people with pointy heads and um, the entrepreneurs the innovators are battling the system because the um, horizon three people are um, just dreamers and the horizon one people are stuck in the mud and won't release 
investment funds. And, but through working with 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 um, uh, sort of workshops and so on, if if you get everybody recognizing that they each have that voice in them, that even even the died in the world protective executive with a lot of vested interest has worries about their grandchildren <laughs> so they've got horizon three there um if um if the um the the the, the horizon one managerial culture has has been saved by some good innovations from Horizon 2. There is a more appreciation, you know, like um, I remember one finance group that I had a peripheral connection with through my then boss at the time was that the that they um, rather like a manufacturing company, they allocated a percentage of their um, what would normally be taken as profit as that speculative in, innovative fund um uh you know like 3m saying 10 percent of engineers time can be spent doing what they like with a certain level of starting budget you know and um new products come come out of that so so i think the conversation of the three voices now that means that, that the inner development the, from the, the sort of psychological leadership is is obviously things like appreciative inquiry, um, um, obviously listening skills, and um, a deeper appreciation of how the whole system needs to work. Uh, the, the, the risks of tuning out the other perspectives becomes more um in you know evident and intense um and also it's more fun you know that's you know we shouldn't forget that that um oh i'm free to think oh that's interesting you know i haven't had a chance to do that for a while it, you know it, it's it, it's an exciting journey as well Anthony, so the start, uh, there's a lot more obviously you could go into there in the group dynamics and so on, but uh, it gives you a kind of feel of, of think of it as three voices that need to have a conversation out of which emerges the new potential. Uh, I think there's a lot of rich material uh, on your website and elsewhere uh, in terms of conceptual uh, understanding and how to bring it alive in a profession, in organization, in society, uh, to create consequences would be uh, an important uh, question to discuss. And we shall discuss that in the last 30 minutes. But I wanted uh, to join the dots uh, of what Nico said, what Anthony said, and what Chris Patterson asked. Uh, Chris, uh, on, uh, uh, Chris Patterson, on his second question, do any of you think we have been through a transition in thinking in the past in the profession, which we could use as an example of what we can do to face the future? And I know Chris Patterson is from the Government Actuaries Department. And I, I suppose, uh, uh, Nico, you and I could respond. I would uh, encourage Chris to come to the past president's panel uh, on the 16th, where we can have a more uh, thorough discussion. But by what you say, uh, there are, and I don't want to spend too much time there, but Nico said, uh, and I think that is a deep insight, that at one time, we did design the game. We did draw the lines and the rules. So if there's a screw up, we are actually responsible. We cannot say we are only players. Yeah? And I think there is a growing realization in the profession that actually we are responsible. If we are not just players. Right? And, 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 so I think that was a good one. And, and Anthony, you, you made a great point earlier, which resonate a lot with me, which was about, it is not about move, throwing what we have away, but to honor, to, uh, to repolish uh, the legacy we have in the past. Hence, I always use the stable in as an image. Because it is true, I think, if you look into our history, we, uh, the risk theory 
uh, uh, and the uh, statistical models was in response to the challenges of their time, where those give answers. But now we are at a different inflection point where the complexity is different. And I think the advice given by past presidents about dwelling into the bustle of humanity, to go into wider fields, to be multidisciplinary, to be more courageous and imaginative, actually speak to that space. So we do not cling too hard to the skill sets of today, although they are still very important next week, but somehow opening the box. And I sense from the conversations we are having in different parts of the profession uh, that we, we could be, if we listen hard enough, we might be able uh, to help find a way out. Yeah. Uh, so, so with that, uh, and, and I don't know whether you, you want to be a last comment uh, before we go to the group, uh, uh, because I, I wanted to go into the area on how to bring all this into reality. Uh, uh, Erica, Nico, or Anthony, uh, you, you want to make a last comment? Can I make one last one? Is that all right? Um, so I, I think there's a sense of um, a crisis that we shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, so the crisis of the pandemic has shown us that video conferencing is actually okay. And in many ways, it's better than okay because I'm speaking to you, Suche, from, from the other side of the planet. Um, so, you know, the, the, I remember a year ago, 15 months ago, worrying about things that I never thought I would worry about in terms of the existence of money and all sorts of exciting things about, you know, governments have created all of this money, what happens to markets. And I think there's a sense of prioritizing horizon two, horizon three things based on your ability to act as well. So there were things that could happen in six months time, which would take us five months to prepare for, and which would be existential if they happened. Those were probably very important things for us to, to, to work on. There were things that could happen in six months time, which might take us 10 years to prepare for. And there's a acceptance to some extent that those are probably beyond our, our scope. So I think that was just the, 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 the kind of linking point to that kind of low probability piece. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to speak about how I don't believe in probability, probability at all, uh, but that's a, that's a different question entirely. Yeah. Um, if you don't have any burning points, uh, maybe I, I want to open a new area, uh, which links up three questions. Yeah, uh, uh, there's uh, and all, all three of us. Uh, we we could start with a a, a header question: How do we get society to listen to good or right ideas? Uh, so there is an assumption what we discuss here are good ideas. Yeah, how do we get society to listen to good or right ideas? And then as a gentleman uh, by the name of Nikki uh, hoff uh, and he asked the question, Dr. Hoffson, many thanks for profound insights and providing challenging yet practical frameworks. But the question is, how do we initiate community coherence? Yeah. So, so it's how to get things started, right? One, two, and the third one, uh, which is even more specific, uh, uh, actually trust data and want it to be evidence-based. How can we as a profession deal with things like anticipatory present moment and similar ideas? Uh, so so uh, if I had to summarize, uh, we are familiar with things we are familiar with. Uh, uh, and to go outside, uh, how do we do that? Uh, how do we accommodate that? And how do you jumpstart uh, a conversation uh, about the football field when we are just playing in the field? How do we jumpstart? How to redesign the game when we are actually playing at the same time? Yeah, if I, if I use this as a metaphor analogy, um, Anthony, uh, you didn't use the word reflexivity, you know. So uh, I, I uh, because that word came to my mind when 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 I saw some of the questions. Um, uh, the floor is yours, Anthony. Um. Yeah, how do you reform the world? Uh, yeah, I'd like to find somebody who can tell me. Yeah, um, I, I, I think um, one of the issues with media, whether it's radio, television, or or this, is that um, there's a tendency to um, 
for us to feel that something is going wrong if the silence so i just caught myself then i'd like to just sit back and reflect and think about this a bit before i say anything and i thought no i can't do that there are maybe a couple of hundred people sort of hanging around out there wondering what's gone wrong um but what we've experimented with in uh, not just in uh, h3 uni but in some similar outfits that we we know about is actually um recognizing that we can tune in by sharing silence with visualization even over the internet in zoom now i, I was a skeptic uh, it was only the as nico hints the the extreme pressure of the of the pandemic that said well you know what else can we try um so uh, in in so far as it's possible to introduce small doses of mindfulness in into how we approach these things that that's 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 a step the same thing the reason i'm so keen on on these um models is in a different way from the way they're used in 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 say mathematical modeling um, to me they're models for facilitation so so each model that i use is a kind of football field in itself and we have procedures and workshops and trained facilitators to be able to hold uh, mini workshops that um, guide people through using the model to discover better what they know and discover uh, in, you know, using scientific language use as a heuristic to discover new um, new insights and, and new combinations and in doing that together uh, a common language begins to emerge um now the the next point is that if this is not connected with something that has to be done in other words if it's just treated as kind of normal education system teaching and instruction that reinforces the knowledge side and blots out what i call the understanding side which is uh i am implicated in what i am doing um and and so um we find that um in such development um the real problem has to be brought to the table and worked on with the model with the facilitation process with some attention to being mindful together so for example um, um but my workshops um you have know, people from new zealand to california taking part and I, I i insist that if anybody um participates in them multitasking is absolutely forbidden that that people not having their visual on the screen is not not the way it's done we have to be able to see the body body language and facial expressions not 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 in the sense of studying them but just in that subliminal sense that we all have because we've you know we meet we're social beings um and by bringing those things together perhaps we can create little microcosms where where this sort of change can 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 get started um but if if i'm being asked how do you change society um with great difficulty very slowly and probably over centuries <laughs> um you know i th i think um the the only thing that would 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 make this something of a quick fix I think is is the um, 
Nico's point about not wasting a good crisis that you know that, that the uh, I don't think we should deliberately create burning platforms but um, nature will throw them at us and maybe that's part of the curriculum but the danger the danger is this back to normal there ain't no normal and we'll never get back to it that there's an interesting book in the uh, Carlos Castaneda um, series called Journey to Ixtlan where the the sorcerers want to get back to their hometown of Ixtlan and they set off on this journey and discover by the end of the book that it's just not possible to get back to where they started. <clears throat> um, so Anthony, uh, I, I want to take uh, to do two questions uh, before we wrap up, uh, but I but I I got a response from uh, Paul Collier from a previous uh, lecture, and he says that change is inch by inch, and of course, uh, it can go suddenly quicker and slower, uh, and it could take years, and it can move with tipping points, right? But do you, uh, you, can, you can address it as part of the answer to the next question. Do you sense that we are in the thickets of the forest, and there's an emerging tree horizon, North Star? But we are beginning to enter in the tickets because we already accept Horizon One is bankrupt uh, and is full of difficulties. Yeah? You, you can hold on to the response, and, and I welcome Nico and Erica's view. But I want to tackle uh, broader questions from Charles Hatt uh, and Anthony Asher. Uh, and, and they are linked, huh? so I want to link so that you, you are free to respond. Uh, Charles Hatt uh, basically say, uh, we should be evolutionary and not revolutionary. At the same time, uh, we be experimental uh, and we be safe to fail. But how do we speed this up? Yeah. So his, his question has a, a lot of contradictions and paradox. Yeah. And I think that whether we like it or not, we might move into politics. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Asher uh, from Australia, a South African actuary uh, with Steve in ethics, uh, asks. Uh, the extent, uh, uh, what, what is the extent of the tension between short term and longer horizons? Is it intellectual, moral, or political? And to the extent that it is political, how can we escape as a profession, I assume, uh, partisan politics? So there's one, there's issue about pace, uh, evolution and pace, and we're going to do quick evolution quickly, highly paradoxical. And, and uh, Anthony Asher basically says that uh, can we avoid uh, partisan politics? Yeah, is there a, a, a different way to do it? Uh, we don't have to agree with his assumption, uh, but that was the question he asked. And and mm. and I don't know, uh, Erica or uh, Nico, you want to respond first before we pass it to Anthony? Uh, okay, Nico, you'd like to have a go. I mean, I think I was going to comment on. I was going to comment on both of those questions. So the. Um, Evolution or revolution, I think, are subjective words which depend on your standpoint. So uh, we've seen in the last, uh, what is it, three months or so, that the Delta variant became the dominant uh, form of COVID in, in the UK. Um, and we're now waiting to see whether the Lambda variant is. Is that evolution? I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly what uh, the scientists call it, but it's quite revolutionary if you're an Alpha variant uh, COVID microbe and you're you're, you're hoping to survive into the future. So, you know, if you're outside of the pension system and you see it as the game of trying to retire uh, before you die, then, you know, any change from DB to DC to state pension, those are just incremental evolutionary changes. If you're in the system and it is your job that is being changed and all of the assets of a huge institution, of course, that's revolutionary. So I, th I think that's a sort of standpoint question. And to a large extent, obviously, the bigger systems are harder or more damaging to have revolutions in. So climate change as a revolution over a very long time horizon or an evolution of very small integration of the centigrade every, every year. Uh, you know, the, the, the smaller the system, the easier it is to have a, a kind of a revolution which sort of um, can be resurrected from, from outside of the system and, and, and the, the functioning kind of be restored. But yeah, so I think the answer is both 
Um, and to some extent, standing outside of the system we're talking about is the, is the best way to kind of make the, the observation or the decision as to, to kind of what those are. And then I was just going to react on the politics question, because I think there's two pieces there. So, so, so one is, what is politics? And I think um, an aphorism I would offer is that the most political thing is the thing that is discussed to be not politics. Um, so the conversations were ex which are excluded from our parliaments are probably the most political conversations because they have no voice. Um, and then I think buried within that as well, you've, you've called out Anthony partisan politics. And I think that is a really important distinction between the mechanisms that power has to impose its will externally um, and the kind of the way that the, the game is being constructed and refereed. Um, uh, you know, I'm often accused of voting for either the Blues or the Reds, depending on what I've said and who I'm talking to. So I wonder if that's something we can all try and have, is uh, uh, the perception that we're partisan, but from, from uh, knowing that we're not. Um, so I think the distinction between, uh, to answer the first part of the question, it, it, uh, for me, everything is politics, um, but, uh, you know, partisan politics is a smaller subset of that. So, so maybe I'm being semantic in my answer, but uh, that, that would be uh, how I address it. Mm -hmm. Anthony, Erica? Yeah, uh, so I come in then. Um, I, th I mean, you said, uh, Suiche, that actuaries trust data. Well, then here's some data that there's pretty good evidence from science that evidence <laughs> is not what changes people's minds and it's not what changes people's mindsets. So, I mean, thinking, for example, of the, the financial system, you know, there's been um, crashes multiple times. They're still doing the same old thing, you know, the same old things that lead to these problems and will lead to them again, uh, inevitably. So transitions in thinking don't rely on data, they don't rely on evidence. Does information lead to chaos? Perhaps if we interpret it in the wrong way. So, I mean, the kind of evolution, revolution, chaos, I think as Nico said, it's a matter of standpoints. For some people, the future will be chaos and for some people it will be very comfortable, thank you very much. And the question is kind of how do we, how do we construct a political economy that can help to bring as wide a range of voices into that as possible so that everybody feels like they've been done well enough by the system. So again, it comes back perhaps to what Nico was saying about changing the rules, you know, rewriting the rules in a de democratic and sensible way. But maybe Anthony would like to say more about uh, if transitions in thinking don't rely on data, what is it? I think that comes back to the other question as well. What is it that does spark transitions in thinking and changes to mindsets? Okay, we are in the last eight minutes. I'm going to pass the floor to Anthony. But before you, you do that, can Nikki uh, flash the QR code uh, for feedback survey so that people get a chance to do it before before uh, before ten thirty before you go for your next meeting? Yeah, just do your QR code. It'll be sent to you as well. Um, uh, I, I I I I think uh, Erica. Uh, no, I I would I would answer the question. Uh, I would respond. I would ask uh, Anthony. And then there's a question from Sam McCord, which I'd like to touch on, and then maybe provide that as a bridge to the presidential uh, conversation on the 16th. Um, uh, uh, Anthony, uh, can you use the next three minutes uh, as a response to, to the politics and the uh, evolutionary thing, and maybe some general points of three to five minutes uh, before I close the session, yeah? Anthony? Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, What we've learned about um, complex systems is that they have emergent properties, meaning you can't predict what will come out of a complex system. You can predict some things, but things will emerge that you haven't predicted. And so um, any um, attempt to change a situation by planning is going to have great difficulties. That's why my, my book is called um, Systems Thinking for a Turbulent World, because the important thing in a turbulent world is 
how do you navigate? Um, if you've got a, an ordnance survey map, you can plan your route and provided there aren't unexpected roadworks or um, revolutions in the street or something, you, you can plan your route. But what happens when you're traveling in a landscape that itself is changing? Uh, you need very rapid navigation system where you're constantly picking up signals and and adapting and you need um you need an all-terrain vehicle uh you know that can go on land and water and ideally fly as well um to um uh, to, to to be effective so um part of the difficulty is that our institutional structures are very much based on the the, the mechanics of, of um, top-down thinking and manageable linear processes whereas actually the real world is is um, a tangled pattern of complexity um, so uh, we, we, we've tended to shift our language from, from talking about planning the future to navigating into the future. And that navigating into the future requires learning. And it requires not just individual learning, but organizational learning. And when I worked with, um, particularly closely with Ari de Hurst, the head of group planning in Shell for a period, um he he actually uh, managed somehow i don't know how he did it to wangle um a few million dollars to put into um a, a, a global survey of the best that was understood about learning and um tried to approach strategy as a learning process so that's that's part of the 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 difference that that no amount of data will enable you to learn what needs to be learned if you if you can navigate you can make very good use of data so it's not saying you don't need it but the kind of idea that we can create artificial intelligence big data and will will solve the problem so yeah we can do that we can get better medical diagnosis on conditions where we have masses of data but we can't we can't use artificial intelligence particularly to deal with illnesses that we don't know exist and haven't occurred yet um Anthony, uh, I, I got to close the session shortly uh the next 20 seconds um okay, okay. well Thank you for listening to this sort of tirade of um, of thoughts. Um, there, there, there is. Um, I think the key thing is that th this point I was making that concepts can become methods which operate in the way that we use our minds, not simply as analytical tools. And there, there's a whole library on the H3 Uni website hcuni.org okay um i i, I think it uh, before i uh, well i i thank you anthony for sharing your time and more importantly your ideas uh, with us uh, and i uh, the q and a um, uh, martin white uh, I, I, and also uh, thomas don't know, uh, Thomas don't know, uh, 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 who are obviously great fans uh, of the conversation. Uh, Mayu Gehen, uh, your questions on pensions, we hope to do another time. Uh, and uh, Sam McCord, your question on on how Ivory could engage more horizon, horizon tree thinkers, uh, maybe we could roll it forward to uh, the 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 July 16 conversation uh, because we got but but you see clearly we are we ourselves are a pluralistic organization and all of us have different things and the ability our ability needs to engage and to listen to this and to create a space where we can have deep interest uh, is one of the conditions uh, which we need to encourage and inculcate uh, 
uh, I, I think with, uh, if, if there's a groundswell of people who are interested in this, uh, we can certainly work with Anthony uh, a bit more uh, and to introduce you to the right groups. Uh, clearly, uh, this is worth uh, reflecting on. Uh, it's not just about mind, but about our presence and our own consciousness. Yeah. So, so with, with this, I, I need to bring the event to a close Yeah, because it's already uh, 10.30 uh, in the UK. Uh, so, so thank you very much, and thank thanks uh, to Erica and Nico, not just for this session, uh, but also helping uh, me and uh, and Anthony to situate his ideas uh, more uh, in a compelling way and a way which creates the listening uh, uh, in our way. And to a certain extent, uh, we have succeeded. Yeah, uh, the next event uh, is uh, by Professor Ibarra of the London. Business school, uh, which again will be unorthodox and unconventional because he's proposing that we act first instead of thinking first. So act before you think, yeah. And then we move into insight, uh, into outside rather than inside, yeah. Uh, so don't rely on inside, but rely on outside. So if you if that piques your interest, uh, I would encourage you to come and and sh and she will be uh, and the panelists would be our our new IHOA president, uh, Louis Pryor and Hash Pippadi. Uh, who's an actually uh, based in Malaysia, who has uh, an interesting career as well. So with that, I, I, it concludes uh, today's event. Uh, and I thank all of you uh, for attending. Uh, and I found it to be very engaging. Uh, thank you for your participation. I will see you uh, at the next event at, uh, uh, at the Professor, Professor Ibarra session. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>